today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent means coming. And in this season, we prepare for the coming of Christ. One of the ways we prepare for his coming is by making an Advent wreath and lighting its candles to remind us of the gifts Christ brings to the world. The Advent wreath includes many symbols to help us think about Christ and his gifts. The wreath itself is in the shape of a circle. A circle has no beginning and no end. This reminds us that there is no beginning and no end to God, and that God's love and caring are forever. The light from the candles that grows stronger each Sunday of Advent reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. Today we light the candle of hope. The people of Israel hoped in God's promises and were not disappointed. Again and again, God delivered Israel from its enemies. We too have the same experience of salvation. That is why we believe in God's promise to send Jesus to us once again, to judge the world and establish his kingdom forever upon the earth. Hope is like a light shining in a dark space. As we look at the light of the Advent candle, we celebrate the hope we have in Jesus Christ. John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the hope you give us. We ask that as we wait for all your promises to come true, and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your hope with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. first Sunday of Advent, as we unite our voices and sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, O come,
This morning our reading comes from John 1, chapters 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of the mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He had came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We, see, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. this time we are privileged to participate in a baby dedication for Micah Liam Starr, his parents Josh and Echo, and some sisters. We're excited to have family uh, here and to join with them today. So why don't Josh and Echo, you stand right here in front of us. In scripture we read, On the eighth day, when it came time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. For Joseph and Mary, their presentation of Jesus at the temple was a fulfillment of the law. But I believe we sense in the reading of this account that it was his desire and excitement. I sense the same for you today. You have come not only today as a religious obligation, but a willing desire to present back to God the gift of your son, Michael. It is a special treat this morning to be a participant in this ritual and to covenant with you in the act of dedication. In presenting this child for dedication, you signify not only your faith in the Christian religion, but also your desire that Micah may early know and follow the will of God, that he may live and die a Christian and come into everlasting blessedness. To accomplish this, you are promising God today that you accept the responsibility to be the kind of parents that will teach Micah to fear the Lord at an early age, to carefully monitor his education so that he will not be led astray, and to direct his youthful mind to Scripture the Holy Scripture, and to bring him into the body of Christ, to restrain him from evil associates and habits, and as much as possible, 
you will bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As a part of this ritual today, you are proclaiming publicly that it is your desire and your promise to endeavor to do all of these things with the help of the Lord. Josh and Echo, will you do your best to bring Micah up in this manner? If so, answer, I will. I like hearing that sound. I like the response of a dad and a mom who stand before their church family and make a declaration of their desire. Standing beside you here are your parents, grandparents, family, excited to be a part of this precious grandson's life and a part of these parents' life your kids. And today we would ask you that you would pray for them, that you will support and encourage them, and that you will love this child along with the other grandkids, and do your best to demonstrate the love of Christ and what it means to be a Christian. Will you endeavor to do so by the help of God? If so, answer, I will. We also have a special aunt. I, now, this, I know this is not part of the script, but your parents, your family are from Minnesota. And your sister flew in just for this dedication from Washington. That's awesome. Thank you for being a part of that. But Josh and Echo, not only do you have family standing beside you, you have a church family that believes in the opportunity that God has given to us and the responsibility to be a part of your life and to help you and support you and encourage you raising up Micah. Congregation, would you please stand? Will you today proclaim to Josh and Echo as parents that you, their church family, will be a support to them that you will be a prayer partner and an encouragement to them along the journey as they endeavor to fulfill God's, the role of godly parents. If so, answer, we will. You may be seated, congregation. Let's pray together. gracious, kind, and heavenly Father, we come before you, and at this moment in time, we present Micah, Liam, Star to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in an act of dedication with a great sense that uh, we know that you love us and that you have given this precious couple the gift of this precious baby. And Lord Jesus, we pray that as Micah grows up, that he truly will come to know you, and that he will be your follower. We pray your blessing upon these parents, in the name of Christ, amen. Well, as we pray this prayer of dedication, and uh, we come now to this moment to present to you this bouquet. Micah is represented by the little white rosebud, kind of nestled down among the baby's breath on the bouquet of flowers. And just like his life, it's ready to bloom, to grow. But he's protected now by a red rose and a yellow rose and a bunch of other flowers but it's a white rose, he's pure. And as parents, as we've, you've made this act of dedication, you will have the opportunity to train him and to teach him and do your best to keep him pure along the journey. Josh, we've placed the red rose. You've heard it many times. You've heard it with your other kids. But the red rose is symbolic of the blood of the Father, Jesus Christ, who gave his life so that we might live. And so as you see this red rose in this bouquet, May you be reminded of the role and the opportunity that you will play to love your son like none other. And Echo, we put the yellow flower here representing the, the softness and the tenderness of a mother's love. As you hold him, as you sing to him, 
as you watch him grow, may he see the softness and tenderness of his mother's love. Down here in the front, family, we have the Gerber daisy that represents you. Uh, it's kind of one flower with many petals. And each of you will have different opportunities to influence Micah and the other kids. But may it be a reminder of the opportunity that you have. And then the daisies represent the congregation. Josh and Echo, you have a church family that loves you and has committed to you before God today that they will support and be an example uh, for what it means. So we also have to present to you today this, dedicate, this certificate of dedication as a reminder of this day and that it will always be a special, special day. May the Lord bless you. I'll let you carry that if you don't mind. Thank you. Would you turn and look at the congregation? And congregation, would you congratulate them today on this special, special moment? As they return to their seats, we invite you now to stand and greet one another today in the name of the Lord. And uh, may the Lord bless you throughout this day.
encourage you to take whatever posture most helps you worship as we continue to lift our voices in praise. A thousand times I danced till your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine with Just thinking about the whole Christmas story. There's so many different aspects that uh, we can reflect on, that teach us. I was thinking as we cry out about the 
the magi, the wise men, that uh, saw the star in the east and began a journey and traveled many, many miles, many days. And uh, along the journey, I wondered, you know, what did they have for road signs? What was it that guided them? Well, we know it was the star. But what guides us in our journey? What guides us along the way? A few of you know that we traveled up to Kansas, and a few of you actually made comments to me this week about my, uh, unst- or my uh, GPS. And, uh, you know, I kind of made mention to one of them. I said, well, you know, I like to use the GPS because it always comes up with a story for me. But actually my story this week is not from the GPS, it's from the road sign. I know the road between here and Pittsburgh, Kansas very, very well. But there is a section that starts and begins about uh, 12 miles south of Pittsburgh where three roads become one road. Highway 400 travels east and west across Kansas. And when you come west out of Wichita, come east out of Wichita, traveling from the west, and you come to Highway 69, Highway 400 turns south. But then there's also Highway 160 that comes out of uh, Missouri. And when it comes into Highway 69, it turns south as well. And I noticed that when I got past that intersection, there was three road signs on the road all together. They said, South Highway 69, West Highway 160, East Highway 400. And I thought about that. I mean, we're on, I was on one road going one direction, but they tried to tell me I was going three. And, and I wondered about that. I wondered in my spiritual life, how, how true, how focused am I upon the star to keep me on the right road to my destination? The foot of the Savior. And so this morning as we prepare to go to prayer and we'll sing this chorus that says Emmanuel, I just kind of vision in my mind that the, the magi, the wise men, the scripture says they bowed down and worshipped him. They had followed the one true star and it brought them to a place that I believe in their heart they cried out, Emmanuel, God with me. And this morning as we prepare to go to prayer, I just, I I want us all to travel on the same path this Advent season. The path, the journey, the road that leads us. Whether the signs say 400 east or 160 west or 69 south, I hope that somehow we find the sign that leads us on the right road, that brings us to the feet of the Savior. As we prepare to go to prayer today, as we sing this course, would you bow your heart and worship Him today? You can do it here at the altars. You can kneel there at your pews. You can stand before the Lord. You can sit with the King. But let's come before Him and declare He is God with us.
Father, as we have gathered in your presence today, we believe that you have taken us and brought us to a place where we find ourselves bowing down before you and worshiping you as our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son. Jesus, I thank you that you gave up all of the kingly and heavenly kingdom so that you could come and live here on this earth and be human, become like a man, be a man, but yet in your humanness, you did not sin, and thus you became, and that you were and are our perfect sacrifice that we can present back to the Father for the atonement for our sins. Lord Jesus, I pray that in the midst of this Advent season that you would take us on a journey that would lead us on a path that would continually, over and over, bring us before you. And Father, in the midst of, of your perfection, in the midst of your holiness, I pray that your light and your power would shine upon us. And Lord Jesus, if there would be anything in us that would be unbecoming to you, that would hinder our relationship with you, I pray, Lord, that you would give us a great sense of conviction and that you would give us the, the desire to confess before you and us to receive the gift of hope that you offer to us this morning on this first Sunday of Advent. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in the many things that uh, we have, have witnessed in the midst of answered prayers. We, we pray for little Liam Nix today. We're thankful for good reports. We pray that you continue to strengthen this little baby. We thank you for the baby that we've dedicated today, and we pray for Micah and and his parents, as we've already prayed for them. Lord, we rejoice uh, with Jason Seifert this morning. We're thankful that he was dismissed from a hospital yesterday, and that he'll be home in Mustang this week, today, this afternoon. We pray that you continue to strengthen him and, and uh, bring healing to his body. And then, Lord Jesus, this morning, I just pray that for all of us, that this time of Christmas would be a spiritual experience. That we would encounter the living Christ who loves us so much. And Lord Jesus, as we receive your love, challenge us to love one another. Thank you for hearing us today. Thank you for your commitment to be a part of us. Open our mind and our hearts to your holy word as you continue to speak. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. Boys and girls, listen closely. Don't hop up. Just listen for a moment, boys and girls. This is today is Family Worship Sunday. And out in the uh, foyer, there was a table that had uh, a couple of packets, work packets for you, one for the pre-K and kindergartners and one for the first through the fifth graders. If you did not pick one of those up, parents, you might want to, during this time, uh, take just a few moments and go back and get one. But kids, here's we're, you're going to stay in here and you get to hear me preach today. But... Let me tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to some of you during the sermon this morning, and I want you to be thinking about this question, okay? Because this is what I'm going to ask you a little bit later in the sermon. So, boys and girls, are you listening? If you could give away any gift to your best friend, what would you give them? Okay? If you could give something away to them, if you could go to the store and buy them a gift, what would you get for your best friend? It could be your parents, or it may be somebody you go to school with, or it could be your sister or your brother. But what gift would you give away? All right, kids, you be thinking about that because we're going to look at that here in a few moments. We continue in an act of worship by presenting back to the Lord his tithe and our offering. 
Take me back time and again. I'm forgiven. All the heartache that I keep, still you hold me when I weep. The grace that holds. Oh. 
Thank you, Megan. Thank you for your great words. He is so good. He has ever been faithful. And uh, I hope that you've celebrated his faithfulness throughout this week during this time of Thanksgiving. Uh, we maybe should turn out all the lights for a moment for this quick question. Uh, if I were to ask you to confess, you don't have to respond, but if I turned out the lights, maybe you'd feel more comfortable. How many of you ate too much turkey during the week. Oh, you don't have to tell me. Oh, oh there we go. Now you can tell. No, you got to be quick. Well, most of us experience an abundance of food this week. And uh, probably a few of you are like me and you had more than one big meal. But I want to share open today with a few thoughts of, uh, about diets. You ready? One gentleman said, I don't exercise at all. If God had wanted me to touch my toes, he would have put them higher up on my body. So here's some diet information. Maybe some of you have heard of the garlic diet. It's simply eat lots of garlic. You don't lose weight, you just look thinner from a distance. And, and maybe some of you heard these excuses during the week. That piece of pie was just calling my name. Or it's my birthday, so I had to eat the whole pie. Or maybe we said it was Thanksgiving, and I just had to eat the whole pie. Um, some might say I had to get that bitter taste out of my mouth from eating the so-called diet food, so I ate a candy bar. Well, I like the one where the, the gentleman went to the doctor and uh, was telling the doctor that he was trying to lose weight. And so the uh, doctor prescribed him a bottle of pills. But he said, I do not want you to swallow in any of them. Just spill them on the floor twice a day and pick them up one at a time. And finally, a, w a wife speaks to her husband who keeps telling her that he is going to lose weight. She says, last night there were two pieces of cake in the pantry, and now there is only one. 
how do you explain that? And the husband replied, I guess it was so dark I didn't see the other piece. Well, Thanksgiving Day is over, but my friends, the Thanksgiving season, an attitude of gratefulness should continue all year. We are truly a blessed people, and let us remember to give him thanks. Well, I, I told you kids that I was going to invite you to be a part of this service today. We're even going to put you up on the big screen here. So, But you'll have to do that. You'll have to come down here by me. If you... Uh, the question is, if you could give away something to your best friend, give any gift that you could think of that you would want to give, what is it that you would want to give away? So if you want to answer it, just come right down here, and we're going to get your information right here so that you can be seen on the screen. So just come on up and just kind of line up. Just a second here. Let's wait until we get everybody up here. We're going to wait until we get you on the screen. You can't quite see it. Let me move over a little bit. We want to see you on the screen before you give that answer. Oh, there you are. You see yourself? Now, when you look that way, they'll all see your face. Tell us your name. My, my name is Crystal. And what would you give to your best friend? American Girl Doll. An American Girl Doll. Thank you, Brooklyn. Good. Tell us your name. My name is Sarah. Now... I thought your name was Sarah Macaroni. That's what I saw on Facebook this week. Didn't you ask me to be your friend on Facebook? You didn't? It sure looked like you. I think your brothers are playing with your face. Do you have a mom? Does she have a Facebook account? Yeah, I think someone's playing with your Facebook account. Okay, tell us your name again. Sarah, Sarah Macaroni, right? No, Sarah. Tell, what would you get? Give away. Barbies, all right, good deal. Okay, April, come here. Not April, April's back there, right? Mama's back there. Chloe, what would you like, what's your name? I'm sorry, say that again? Chloe, Chloe and what would you give away? A lie baby? All right, good, thank you. All right, so go back and sit with Mama or Grandma. Tell us your name. Kesslin, and what would you give away? Your Barbies? Wow. Cool. Okay. And what's your name? Joshua. Joshua. You're Josh Macaroni too, aren't you? I thought so. What would you give away? A Nerf Blaster. Did you see yourself on TV? You know, look look over here. Come over here. If you look, uh, you can see the back of my bald head. Yes. Okay. There we go. Good, thank you. Austin. Austin, and what would you give away? Legos. Legos, cool. All right. What's your name, miss? Kayla. Kayla, what would you give away? Uh, my Barbies and, and that goes with the house. Your Barbies that go with the house. All right, good. What's your name there, sir? Evan. Evan, what would you give away? A Star Wars Lego set. A Star Wars Lego set. Okay, cool. And what's your name, miss? Savannah. What? Savannah. Savannah. What are you going to give away? Your two front teeth? No. Oh, okay, what? Tar. I get, ooh, cool. Thank you. Sir, what would you, what's your name? Austin. Austin, what would you give away? A baseball, because he likes baseball. Cool, thank you. You were thinking about your best friend. Cool, that's great. Thank you. Okay, sir, tell me your name. Mark. Mark, and what would you like to give away? A toy truck. A toy truck. Awesome. Good deal. Thank you. Now, I, now, Mom and Dads, I'm trying to help you out here. Okay? You know, what they're giving away is probably what they want. What's your name? Ryan. Ryan, what would you give away? A kitty. A kitty. Ooh. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Daniel. Daniel, what would you like to give away? A baby guinea pig. A baby guinea pig. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sir, what's your name? Kaden. Yes, Kaden, what would you like to give away? A Spider-Man toy. Okay, good. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Kennedy. Kennedy, what would you like to give away? A ring. A ring. Wow. And your name is? Jessica. Jessica, what would you like to give away? A friendship necklace. A friendship necklace. Cool. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Your name is? 
Victoria, what would you like to give away? A nice pair of earrings. A nice pair of earrings. Wow. Woo. Okay, sir. It looks like you're the last one. Are you the last one? And we save the best for last? Tell me your name. Ethan. Ethan. And what would you like to give away? A Spider-Man toy. A Spider-Man toy. Cool. Thank you. Now, I th thought that we would get the, the kids would like this, but it would help you moms and dads out a little bit. But uh, I just like to hear the kids think about what they would give away. I, I liked, uh, I think it was Austin that said, I'd give away the baseball because he likes baseball. Isn't it fun? What, listen to kids. So kids, thanks. Give them a round of applause. Well, today as we uh, begin this, uh, one of the phrases that we hear a lot during Christmas is the Christmas present. What are you giving? What present would you like to receive around our house? We made a list the other day. But for this Advent, I want to turn the order around and talk about the present Christmas. It's not the Christmas present, but the present Christmas because of the first Christmas, the past Christmas we might call it, the story of God sending his, to us his son, we discover that Christmas is still alive and about today. Christmas is about today. Did, did, did you capture that this morning? I, I love all the stuff that we do with Christmas. I love all the poinsettias, and thank you so much to those of you that's donated to help us beautify. I love the lights and the trees. I love the time of gathering around with family and giving gifts and eating food. But the, the real meaning of Christmas is not the Christmas present, but it is the present Christmas. It is Christ here today, present, right now. He is here. And our first theme of the present Christmas is the theme of hope. Hope. Webster defines hope to cherish a desire with anticipation, to desire with expectation of, of, of obtainment, or to expect with confidence. Then the dictionary goes on to say archaic, the word trust. I, I'm not sure exactly what Webster is fully trying to say. I'm not a, a word guru. And, and we, I was in Sunday school, and they were talking about different words and, and translations and the original language in, in the Bible and stuff. But to me, the whole idea of archaic means that it's the old meaning. And it meant trust. The biblical definition of hope has similar meanings. In the Old Testament, basically there are three Hebrew words which are most often translated hope. They mean to look for something with eager and expectation. Secondly, to rely on something reliable. And third, trust. The New Testament Greek words also have similar meanings, and basically they can be summed up by saying an indication of certainty and a strong and confident expectation. Well, my friends, today the message is, is simply our hope is in Christ who is built on the past and gives us a future because of the promises of hope in Scripture. Let's, uh, I, I really messed you up, Mike. Sorry, we're going to backtrack to the reading of, of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. I, I want us to hear in the midst of this passage an Old Testament prophecy going back into the past where Isaiah is and his people are all wrapped up in a sense of doom and gloom. They have no hope. They feel as if life has been dealing them blow after blow, and, and it's just darkness and gloom. But Isaiah in chapter 9 gives to us some words. 
that, that begin to, to give us a visual into the hope that Isaiah believes is still available for the people. Verse 1, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and, and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days, day of the Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. Uh, did, you, did you catch that, folks? Of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over His kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. People were living in the past, were living in darkness and gloom. They had no hope. But for us living in the present, we discover as we look at the past, we can discover that there is hope. The past takes us to Scripture. We go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created. I, I like that passage in John chapter 1. You're going to hear it every week during Advent. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If we go back into the midst of Scripture, we can begin to discover that God is the God who transforms lives and establishes kingdoms and governments of which there will be no end. It was not talking about Hitler's regime in Germany. It, it was... Folks, it's not even talking about America. It's talking about a spiritual kingdom that God is establishing, His government, of which there will be no end. So no matter what happens in the U.S. of A. or in any other world nation, His government will not end. It is not a, 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 a political government. It is a spiritual government government. God offers to us a hope that it's built upon his past. He spoke into being creation. We can go into Abraham and the promise that God gave to him and, and it promised him that he would be the father of many nations. And even when he became an old man, God still kept his promise. We can look back to that past and see that. We can look into the stories of, of David and how he established an earthly kingdom. But there was a promise given to the people in the past that there would be a ruler who would come from David's 
lineage. We turn into the book of Matthew. And the writer is so it is so significant as he writes the first few verses of Matthew. And he explains to all of us that God is fulfilling his promise of the past so that there is a future, a hope in the future. Our hope today, our biblically based understanding of God is that we can expect Him to work today. It's not just a story in history. It is His story about His presence here today. We read in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. The Apostle Paul is looking back into the past, telling the story of hope based upon what he knew God had accomplished in the past. My question for us today is this. Are we building our hope on what God has done in the past? He is faithful. Knowing God in the past is important. Creation, Abraham, Moses, David, Peter, Paul, Jesus himself reminds us of what God has done in the past. But what about your own past, my friend? Do you have stories of God's power and presence at work in your life? What if we were to have asked these kids right here about God at work in their parents' life? Have they heard the story of God at work in you in such a way that they maybe can't tell the whole story, but they would be able to say, God works, has worked in my parents' life? Are we telling the story of God's work so that we can establish hope in these young children's lives and trust in God? Our hope is also experienced through His promise. This passage in Isaiah 9 provides a promise for the people of Israel. If you look into Luke chapter 2, you'll see that, that the promise of Isaiah is fulfilled before Simeon's eyes. In verse 28, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, it, it was the, the dedication act that we just participated in here today. But in the midst of that, Simeon, who had heard the promise of the past prophet, who had studied the scriptures, and he believed that there was a hope coming, he takes in his arms, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in sight of all of the people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel, God's promise was fulfilled. My friends, God makes similar promises to us. He promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In John 14, he promised to us through his disciples, and if I go away, I will come back. We build our hope on the past. We see over and over stories in God's word that God proved himself. 
Even in our own lives, we have experienced God's presence and His power. And we can build on the past to know that He will give us a hope for the present. But we can also experience hope through, our, through the promises that He has given to us. Paul writes to the church in Rome in chapter 5, verse 5, Hope will not disappoint us. Hope will not disappoint us. A biblical hope, a trust in God. It's not some pie in the sky wish list that we give to Santa Claus. It's a trust that's been proven and given to us over and over again that His government and His peace will not end. My friends today, have you looked back in the past to see God's work? And have you shared that with people? Your kids, your family, your church family. A good Sunday school lesson would be a going around the room and sharing God's power in your life in the past. I want to be experiencing God's presence in such a way that I can stand before you and tell you of God at work in my life and in my world. Have we looked back into the past to see God's work and have we shared that? Parents, share it with your kids. Hey, kids. Thanks for sharing here today, but would you ask your mom and dad something when you go home today around the table? Would you ask them, hey mom, hey dad, how has God worked in your life in the past? And then what are the promises that you claim? What are the promises that God makes to us here in His Word that you claim as your promise? And my challenge to us is this. Let's commit it to memory. Let's study them, let's find them, and let's commit His promise to us, to memory, so that as we go through this journey of Advent this, this year, in 2011, we can share with one another the promises that God has given to us. Hope. It's available for all of us. A trust. A clear expectation of God's presence at work today. Bow your heads with me, Father. We pause today to thank you for being with us. I'm thankful that Christmas is not just a historical event that we remember, but that Christmas can be present today. And that you are alive today. And that we can experience today this gift of your love. That we can experience today a, a time of reflecting and looking back of how you've proven yourself over and over again. That we can find new hope from the new promises that you continually give over and over again. And Lord Jesus, may this journey prepare us for your second advent. Lord, may we believe your promise that you are coming again. And may we ready our heart and ready our mind and ready our feet and our hands to be about kingdom business of loving one another and of loving our enemies. We love you today. In Christ's holy name, amen. You are dismissed. Have a great, great day in the Lord.